the Faithful Baptist Church. It's Sunday morning, 10 a.m., and we have been listening to Adeste Fidelis. It carries a Creative Commons license, Adeste Fidelis. Thank you for joining Pastor France and the Faithful Baptist Church. Father God, may you guide and help us in our studies today. And today we're looking at the laws of God, part two. And we're looking specifically at the Ten Commandments. The laws of God, part two. Now you may say, who are those people in that picture? <laughs> and indeed, it's a very old picture. And they are Ellen G. White and her husband, James Springer White. Now, these two people were very prominent in the early Seventh-day Adventist church. They actually helped to form the direction that the church went in. 
Um, and, and they did that with a lot of sign gifts. Sign gifts were used, prophecy, the word of prophecy, which was later written down and taken on the same level as scripture. In fact, it's actually held above scripture, holy scriptures to some extent, the, the writings. The Seventh-day Adventist or the SDA group teaches that Sabbath keeping began with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and thus was designed for all of mankind. I just wonder if they had access to the King James Version of the Bible. <laughs> Because this is in error, because the Sabbath was not given to man until Israel was in the wilderness. In the book of Exodus, even when Israel was in the wilderness. Also, it was given to Israel alone and not to mankind in general. <clears throat> And so the Sabbath day is a special covenant sign between the chosen people, Israel, the Jews, and God. We are Gentiles. It's not a covenant between us and God. It's a covenant between Israel and God. Okay, so we excluded out of that. <clears throat> now let's look at Exodus chapter 31, verse 16. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day, <clears throat> excuse me, he rested and was refreshed. <clears throat> and that's the end of that reading. Now let's look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 9. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. Verse 10. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy man maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. That's the end of that reading. Now, the keeping of the Sabbath day, you see, it's something that can easily be misinterpreted in the Bible, especially if you have your own translation of the Bible, especially to back up your particular slant that, that you're trying to push the Bible into. Now, the question which a lot of people ask is, the Sabbath day is now the seventh day, and Sunday, we keep Sunday holy, is, are they the same thing? Hmm. In fact, we could ask, 
is Sunday, the Christian Sabbath. You see, the Christian Sabbath is Sunday, the Christian Sabbath. What do you think? The answer is no. <laughs> the Sabbath is always the seventh day of the week. Christians are to dedicate the first day of the week to the Lord, but not in the same sense as the seventh day for the Jews. So we have Christians and we have the Jews. The Christians are to dedicate the first day of the week to the Lord, which is Sunday, and the Jews are to dedicate the seventh day of the week, which is the Sabbath day. Does that make sense? Okay, you, you might say, no, that, that, that's fine. Now, can a Christian work on Sunday? Because the Jews couldn't work on the Sabbath. Can a Christian work on Sunday? And the answer to that is, not if it causes him to miss meeting with his church. <laughs> okay, so if a Christian needs to work on a Sunday, but he can work, get his work around the church service, then I suppose that would be okay. However, ideally, we as born-again Christians should separate the Lord's Day, in other words, Sunday, the first day of the week, as just that, the Lord's Day. So we should try to dedicate to the Lord on the Lord's Day. His day, the, the day for the Lord God, the whole day long. What do you think about that idea? <laughs> now, in the world that we live in, the current work week, week schedule is probably set up to go along with both the Sabbath and the Lord's Day. And that is to say that many of us, we don't work on Saturday or Sunday, we have a, a five-day week. We work Monday to Friday, and the Sabbath, which starts at 6 p.m. Friday night and goes through to 6 p.m. Saturday night, well, we don't work the Sabbath, even although we're not Jews. We still don't work on the Sabbath on the Saturday. And then we don't work on the Sunday, which is the Lord's Day. So we have the Sabbath and the Lord's Day or Sunday. So we're really getting it really well. We've got two days to celebrate. <laughs> so if you come to think of it, you know, people in the world like to think of Friday night as a big party night. But if you're a Jew, the Sabbath starts at 6 p.m. on Friday night. So you can't party on Friday night. In fact, from just after lunch on Friday, you should be preparing for the start of the Sabbath. So Friday afternoons are sort of gone in a way. But the Sabbath ends at 6 p.m. on Saturday night. <laughs> so Jews can go and party on Saturday night without being contrary to the law. How does that sound? Now let's read Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. That's the end of the verse. Now this is the first commandment with promise. In other words, honor the father and mother and the promise that thy days may be long upon the land. So, 
this is a promise that God makes. And so you can be sure that this is kept. In general, those that showed great honor, respect, reverence, obedience to their parents live a long life. And the opposite of this is basically true also. Now, you might say, well, my parents were very strict and unreasonable and all those sort of things. So you're not going to honor your parents. But the truth is that those people who honor their parents honor them despite all those other problems. They honor them in any case. Now, the only reason why God is saying you need to honor your parents is because obviously it's a problem. Look, parents mess up, let's be honest, okay? So you need to honor your parents in any case, regardless of what they've done. I, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Now let's read verse 13, quite a short verse. Thou shalt not kill. That's the end of the verse. Okay, so this is in the sense of murder, okay? God is not saying thou shalt not kill, full stop. But this is in the context and it's in the sense of murder for obviously the jews were many times commanded to kill another human being or another person in wars and in fulfilling god's death penalty laws because the death penalty laws come from god thus we can assume that or we can believe that the taking of an innocent life is what this is all about. This is the context. Thou shalt not kill refers to the taking of an innocent life. Now, I just want to ask you this question because, you, you know, when as a young man, you go to the army and you're asked to kill the enemy, which also happen to be human beings. Now, is it right to be in the military or in the army and at the same time be a conscientious objector? A conscientious objector is somebody who objects specifically to having to kill or try to kill somebody else, even if the government says so. <laughs> So maybe if you were conscripted forcefully into the military or into the army, then yes, you can be in the military and a conscientious objector. But if you join the military voluntarily, then it does not make sense to be a conscientious objector. Now what you need to keep in mind is that in the Old Testament, God specifically commanded the Jews to attack and destroy other peoples. So that attack on the other peoples and the killing of other people was ordained of God. However, just to bring this home, let's say that South Africa goes to war with a neighboring country, then those killings of the enemy are probably not ordained of God. Does that make sense? If you as a soldier kill a soldier on the other side, then that could be considered to be murder but it's accepted, accepted from the point of view of the state. But is it acceptable from the point of view of God? 
However, if you ever were or do get into that situation, you'll find the army officers or the military officers will argue that point away to make the soldiers feel more comfortable with their task. Their task is to attack and kill the enemy. Thou shalt not kill. Now let's look at verse 14. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And you have these three people speaking here. And just by looking at the body language, you can almost sense that something has happened. There was a time where adulterous activity was abhorred by society. If you were somebody who committed adultery, you were not held in high esteem by society. It was something very, very bad that you'd done. However, nowadays or these days, it is almost encouraged, adultery that is, and it's encouraged through television, through music, rock music, where the words are encouraging this type of lifestyle. And even the laws of the land are changing in such a way to make this possible, to try and make it acceptable to society, not to Christians, because we follow the inspired and preserved word of God and God never changes so what God was 6,000 years ago is what God is today mankind or society has changed over time God stays the same so if we follow God and what God says in the Bible then we are forced to take a viewpoint that never changes Society will change around us. Now, remember what Jesus Christ said about lusting after a woman in your heart. You remember those verses? That if you see a woman and you lust after her in your heart, you've already committed adultery. So don't say I'm innocent, I'm good, I'm not guilty of sin and that, because your thoughts, your very thoughts, can be construed as sin as well. Now let's read verse 15. Thou shalt not steal. And why do people steal? Sometimes people still, it's not that they really need the money or anything like that. They may be making a collection of pocket knives, for example, or anything else. Thou shalt not steal, it's the end of the verse. Have you ever stolen something? How about, how about a pin? You might have said to somebody, can I borrow your pen? I just want to write something down. <laughs> you wrote it down and you forgot to give it back again. You see, you've stolen that pen. How about some coins in the ground? You're walking along and there's a coin on the ground, maybe even a note, and you pick it up, you look around, you don't see anybody looking, and you put it in your pocket or your wallet. <laughs> Is that okay? Well, I suppose we should just look at the definition of theft. You see, 
Theft is stealing as well. Theft is taking something that belongs to another person without them being aware of it. So you asked a person if you can borrow their pen and you wrote something with it and they forgot about it and they walked away. And it's not as though you <clears throat> went and stole, you know, grabbed the pen from them. But you had this pen and what should I do with it? So you might have put it in your pocket. So theft is taking something that belongs to another person without them being aware of it. So you pick up that coin off of the ground or that note of money. That doesn't actually belong to you, if you can put it that way. It belongs or belonged to somebody else. Now you're taking that coin or that money. They're not aware of it because they're not there to see it. They may not even be aware that it's fallen out of their pocket and they've lost it. So you're taking it without them being aware and you, it, you're taking it for yourself. Theft. Theft is stealing. Thou shalt not steal. Okay. Robbing. So robbing is taking something from someone with them being fully aware of it. For example, armed robbery. Will a man try and rob God? Probably not. <laughs> but he might try and steal something by means of theft. Try and take something from God without God being aware of it. Do you think that's going to work? <laughs> I'm sure God's going to know what exactly what you're doing. So let's look at verse 16. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. End of the verse. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. End of the verse. And in the picture in the background, you see the forked tongue. <laughs> You've heard the saying that people speak with forked tongue. Yeah. They say one thing to one person and another thing to another person. It also indicates the serpent or the snake, which symbolizes the devil. So how evil it would be to testify falsely in a courtroom against someone who you know well and supposedly is your friend. Now that is actually about as low as you can get. So don't be false witness against thy neighbor. Don't gossip. Because that's where it's, it's, when you gossip, you're on that edge, you're on that knife edge between bearing false witness against your neighbor and just catching up on some news. So be very careful with gossiping. And now let's read the next verse, verse 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. It's the end of the verse. Now this command from the Ten Commandments, it isn't an outward act. It isn't doing something that people can see and say, you know what, 
we see you've stolen that or you've done this or something like that. But this is an inward act of the heart. So this is a sin that you commit on the inside and the people around you don't, don't see you doing it. Unless you say to them, oh, I'm so jealous. My neighbor has this beautiful car and look at my car. <laughs> For for example, now, have you ever strongly desired to have something of someone else's, something that other people might have? It might be a beautiful, nice car. It might be a beautiful house. A fancy dress or really smart clothes. A really expensive set of golf clubs. It might be a boat, a speedboat, or a sailing boat. It may be the way they had their garden landscaped. It may be the way they look. They may look absolutely wonderful. And when you look in the mirror, you think, well, well I don't look like that. <laughs> it could be so many things. covetousness so we have to look at that and realize when we're doing it and if you're thinking it's not fair why do they get that and not me red light should go off you're on the point of breaking the command that I shall not covet And now we want to just skip ahead to verse 18. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. Verse 19. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. Verse 20. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not. For God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. It's the end of the verse. So we need to remember that the same God that the Israelites here feared greatly, that very same God, they were trembling. They thought they were going to die. But that same God is the same God that lives within our own very being. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that mind-blowing? So there are many commandments in the New Testament, but mainly there's the two, to love the Lord thy God with all the heart, and to love thy neighbor as you love yourself. And these commandments in the New Testament are for us as Christians to keep. So we're not specifically to keep the Ten Commandments, but if we keep those commandments in the New Testament, they include the Ten Commandments and all the other commandments in the Old Testament. Now think of this, God has come to prove you, to see if you fear him. Do you fear God? To see if ye sin not. So that's what God's doing to you. And in the background, we have a picture of the 
Capitol building, which houses the Supreme Court in the United States. And if you were to walk up there, you would see near the top of the building a row of the world's law givers. And each one is facing one or somebody in the middle who is facing forward with a full frontal view. It is Moses and the Ten Commandments. As you enter the Supreme Court courtroom, the two huge oak doors have the Ten Commandments engraved on each lower portion of each door. As you sit inside the courtroom, you can see the wall right above where the Supreme Court judges sit. And there is a display of the Ten Commandments. There are Bible verses etched in stone all over the federal buildings and monuments in Washington, D.C. James Madison, the fourth president, known as the father of our Constitution, made the following statement. We have staked the whole of all our political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government, upon the com capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, to control ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. And that's the end of that quote. So basically what he's trying to say is that the American people are following the Ten Commandments. Well, let, let, let's take a break. Get a cup of coffee or something similar while we listen to Oh Holy Night by John Sayles. It carries a Creative Commons license. Oh Holy Night. <laughs> Amen. What a beautiful piece of music. And let's continue now with the laws of God, part two. And in the background, you see the Ten Commandments. And 
yeah, I just want you to look if you can see the second commandment. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Very important. And I just want to read the, uh, a version of the Ten Commandments, um, a, a more correct version of the Ten Commandments. And you may notice that if you read the Ten Commandments in the Bible, and then you read the Ten Commandments, it's always sort of a summary of the Ten Commandments. It's like summarized to a certain extent. So one... Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Five, Honor thy father and thy mother. Six, thou shalt not kill. Seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. Eight, thou shalt not steal. Nine, thou shalt not bear false witness. Ten, thou shalt not covet. Now, Ask a Roman Catholic what the second commandment is. They will very likely quote either the Catholic Bible or the Catholic prayer book, actually. They will say that the second commandment is something like, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Was that the second commandment? <laughs> okay, you should have said no, it, it wasn't. Because the second commandment is, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Now that one's missing from the Catholic Ten Commandments. You see this, Second commandment has been removed from the Roman Catholic Bible. It's not just in the Ten Commandments. It's from the, the Catholic Bible. It's been removed from there. And it's been replaced by the third commandment. And the third commandment has been replaced by the fourth commandment and so on and so forth, until they get to the ninth commandment, which will be, Thy shalt not covet. Now what they've done there, is they split the ninth commandment into two. So they say the ninth commandment is, You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and the tenth commandment is, you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. So the tenth commandment was, Thou shalt not covet, and they split it into two. So the original ten commandments should have read like the ninth, Thou shalt not bear false witness. In the tenth, Thou shalt not covet. And in the Catholic version, you get nine. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You notice they've taken the thou art in modern English, okay? So, and we immediately know that the translation is suspect. You shall not covet your neighbor's goods is the Tenth Commandment. And so here we have the Catholic version of the Tenth Commandment. And you can see there, one, 
And two, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, which is actually the third commandment. And then if you look here at the bottom, 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. That's nine. And 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. Okay, so that is the Catholic version of the Ten Commandments. So it's very important to be aware of this, that the second commandment is actually missing. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Hmm. Now we're taking that commandment out of the Ten Commandments. This enables you to worship the Virgin Mary and for that matter any other graven images that you so desire. So you can make images, you can make icons, well, whatever you want because that commandment doesn't exist in your Bible. <laughs> and of course the tenth one is split into two. Thou shalt not cover suddenly becomes two commandments. Now, I just want to read you the Roman Catholic Ten Commandments so you can compare. One, I am the Lord your God. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Two, ye shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Three, remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. Four, honor your father and your mother. Five, you shall not kill, six, you shall not commit adultery, seven, you shall not steal, eight, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, nine, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, ten, you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. Now that is the Roman Catholic Ten Commandments. And I just want to read the Ten Commandments that come out of the Holy Scriptures, and this is how they should read. One, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Five, honor thy father and thy mother. Six, thou shalt not kill. Seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. Eight, thou shalt not steal. Nine, thou shalt not bear false witness. Ten, thou shalt not covet. Okay, that's the end of the Ten Commandments. Should we keep these Ten Commandments as born-again Christians? <laughs> Now, difficult question, and the question is yes and no. Yes, we should, except for commandment number four, which says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That one, as Christians, we don't need to keep that one, and nowhere in the New Testament is it does it say we need to keep the fourth commandment? But all the others are backed up in the New Testament. Because we are followers of Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ didn't keep the Sabbath day, but he established the day of the Lord, which was Sunday, the first day of the week. And so we keep all the commandments except the commandment number four, the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Because why? Because that is a covenant between the Jewish people and God. Are you a Jew? Are you a Hebrew? Are you an Israelite? If so, and you're following the Jewish religion, then you can keep the Sabbath. But if you're a Jew and you've become a Christian, then no, then you don't keep the Sabbath. Then you keep Sunday, which is the Lord's day.
So in conclusion, we have looked at the way that God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. We have looked at how the Ten Commandments were perverted by the Roman Catholic Church so that they could bring idolatry, um, graven images into the church. How the second commandment was simply removed, which allows them to make and worship graven images. Graven images such as the statue statues of Mary, the paintings of Mary, that one can stand in front of and pray, and then say we're not praying to Mary, we're praying through Mary, not to her. Hmm. How does that work? However, we as Christians are not under the law, but under the grace of Jesus Christ. A very big difference. When we are under the grace of Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost will guide us into complying with every jot and tittle of the law, all 613 laws in the Old Testament. So even when we fail to comply with all the stipulations of the law, we receive forgiveness Forgiveness for our sins, past, present, and future, from Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is because we are under grace. <laughs> you see, you either fall under the law or you fall under grace. If you're a Jew, you fall under the law if, you re if you've rejected your Messiah. But if you've accepted your Messiah, or you're a Christian, and or a Christian, then you fall under grace, and you no longer fall under the law, but you still are responsible to comply with the law, but the Holy Ghost will help you, and where you make a mistake, that is forgiven. I hope that makes sense. So, not only that, but if we don't accept the gift of eternal life from Jesus Christ, then we, by default, if you do nothing, by default, we end up in a lake of fire in conscious suffering for all of eternity. So to me, it's a no-brainer. <clears throat> you know, and people might say, you know, what should we do and, and that. To me, it's a no-brainer. It's a free gift from Jesus Christ. <laughs> Eternal salvation. And we head it by default towards that lake of fire, towards hell. But I might say, well, it's a no-brainer. But it's not so easy for everybody to see it. You see, God gave everybody the freedom of choice. You have the opportunity to choose God, to choose life. So we can choose, uh, it's our free choice. We can choose eternal life or we can choose eternal death and suffering. Sadly, so many people seem to be choosing eternal death and suffering, and so few seem to be choosing eternal life. But that is our free choice. How to become a follower of Jesus Christ, or how to become a Christian. How do you become a born-again Christian? Now, if you feel compelled to take your first step towards Jesus Christ, then you can do that right now wherever you are. It doesn't matter where you are or who you are for that matter. If you are technically a person, then this is for you. So the first thing to recognize is the problem. 
And the problem is we have all sinned and that sin separates us from God. So we over here and we can't get to God because sin is in between us. It separates us from God. And if we can't get to God, we're going to burn in hell for all of eternity in conscious suffering. Now, how do we get to God? So let's just look at the problem. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6 verse 23. So now let's look at the solution. Jesus Christ is the solution. So we need to discover the solution or realize what the solution is. Jesus Christ. <laughs> and Jesus Christ is God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3 verse 16. And I'll soon say that again. That whosoever, and that could be you or me, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So all you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ. It's, it's that simple. Believe in Jesus Christ with all your heart. And you will have everlasting life. That's what the Bible says. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. 1 Peter 3 verse 18. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. So we know what the problem is. The problem is we are separated from God. And we know what the solution is. The solution is Jesus Christ. So all we have to do is to decide to follow Jesus Christ. Respond and decide to follow Jesus Christ. I am the light of the world. Ye that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John 8 verse 12. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. 1 Peter 2 verse 21. If any man come after me, let him deny himself and take, me, take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 9 verse 23. Okay, so now what does it mean to follow Jesus Christ? Okay, so let's just look at that a little bit. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Acts chapter 16 verse 31. You just have to believe in Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. It is so easy. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10 verse 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Ephesians 2 verse 8. You see, there's nothing that we can do to work out our own salvation. It is the gift. It's a gift of God. And that is the only way. So I'm just going to say a sample prayer. You can work out your own prayer or say the same one. It doesn't matter. Dear God, I believe in you and that your son, Jesus Christ, is Lord. 
I believe he died for my sins and was resurrected. I repent and ask for forgiveness of all my sins. I've decided to follow Jesus for all the days of my life. Thank you for your forgiveness and for the gift of eternal life. I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And there's the end of that little sample prayer. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe in the name of the Son of God. 1 John 5 verse 13. <laughs> Believe in Jesus Christ and accept the free gift of eternal life. Now, every week we've been looking at our statement of faith. And today's extract from the statement of faith for our local independent Baptist church is baptism. And now... This very question of baptism is the exact reason why in excess of 50 million Bible-believing Christians or Baptists, if you like, were burnt at the stake and tortured to death um, by the Roman Catholic Church. And that's a conservative estimate, um, 50 million. <clears throat> <clears throat> So uh, I'm going to say get hold of the PDF and there's a whole lot of Bible references. Go and look them all up. But I'm just going to read the little bits in between the Bible references. And it's actually that. There's a whole lot of Bible references and a few words in between. So I'm just reading those few words. <laughs> the scriptures teach that Christian baptism is the single immersion backwards in water of a born-again believer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So, to keep in mind, it's just a single backward movement into the water once, boom, under the water, make sure that that person's completely under the water, and you just say the words, you know, baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and you pick them up. Say it quickly. You don't want them to drown. So don't start saying prayers and that. <laughs> just say the words and, you know, short and sweet and get it over. But notice that, according to the scriptures, it's the immersion of a born-again believer. So the person is already a born again Christian and then they baptized so the baptism doesn't do anything for their faith it's just an outward sign to others to say that they baptized and because that's what Jesus Christ asked us to do as well to show forth in a solemn and beautiful emblem our identification with the crucified, buried, and risen Savior. It pictures our death to sin and resurrection to new life. That baptism has no merit in salvation, and that is the doctrine of baptismal regeneration that it is a prerequisite to the privileges of church membership. That baptism is to perform, be performed under the authority and approval of one of the Lord's churches. And that is to say, an unapostated Baptist church. <laughs> A Bible-believing church or a Baptist church that hasn't apostated their faith. They have authority to administer the baptism. Obviously, 
an official will be appointed the pastor or one of the senior members, typically the pastor. That those baptized differently than previously stated should not be received into membership, but instead should submit to scriptural baptism. And further, that open baptism, in other words, non-Baptist and apostated Baptist and infant baptism are to be wholly rejected. So if you say you were baptized as an adult with sprinkling of water or something of that nature, then we don't accept that baptism as valid. Infant baptism, we don't accept that as a valid baptism because the Holy Scripture says that you, to be baptized, it's believer's baptism. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're already a born-again Christian. It's just the outward sign. And so you get into the water and the pastor will with a single movement backwards under the water, make sure that your whole body is under the water to symbolize the death to sin and say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And you pick them up again, which symbolizes a resurrection to a new life. And that's it. Baptism. Now, very important to remember is that a statement of faith is completely different to a confession of faith, okay? A lot of people confuse the two, and I've even noticed that a lot of churches even get this totally confused and mixed up, and they use a statement of faith and a confession of faith interchangeably. It's almost like saying, we'll use the color green and the color white um, interchangeably. Wherever there's green or white, we put any of the colors, um, it doesn't matter. The truth is, they are very different. Okay, A statement of faith is a brief summary of the doctrines contained in the Holy Scriptures. So a statement of faith is based on the Holy Scriptures. Okay typically upheld by local communities or churches as practiced in the scriptures. An example is a statement of faith of the faithful Baptist church, which is our statement of faith. Now, a confession of faith is a summary of the doctrine as dictated by one of the universal church bodies, such as the Catholic Church or Protestant Church or Orthodox Church. So a confession of faith is a summary of the doctrine as dedicated by a church. A statement of faith is a summary of the doctrines contained in the Holy Scripture. A confession of faith is a summary of the doctrine as dedicated, as mandated by a church. Do you understand the difference and why it's so wide apart and so incredibly different? Okay. So talking about a confession of faith, which is based on what the church says it, we should believe in. And we look at some example. We have the Apostles' Creed, which is more Roman Catholic. The 39 Articles of Faith is the Anglicans, Confession of Faith. The Lutheran Confession of Faith is the 21 articles of the Augsburg Confession. So that is their Confession of Faith. It's not a statement of faith out of the Holy Scriptures. It's out of the Lutheran Church. The Augsburg Confession. Now the Augsburg Confession demonstrates that and quote they dissent in no article of faith from the Catholic Church. End of the quote. 
So the Lutherans sort of admit there that the Augsburg Confession is very much in line with the belief system of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the Methodist Church, which broke away from the Anglican Church, okay, so the Anglican Church had the 39 Articles of Faith, and the Methodist Church had the 25 Articles of Religion. Anglican, 39 Articles of Faith, Methodist, 25 Articles of Religion. Hmm. Anyway, that, that, that's enough examples of trying to you know, statement of faith, confession of faith, okay. I, I've included the statement of faith of the Independent Baptist Church, the Faithful Baptists, below here, and you can go and read it. See if you agree, any points you're not sure about, please come and discuss with us. We are thinking of adding some additional points into, into this just to make it clearer and easier to understand. Father God, we just thank you for this time that we could spend together today to just look at your laws and specifically we have been looking at the Ten Commandments, part one, and today we looked at part two. And it's just beautiful to, to just understand a little bit deeper the Ten Commandments and what they really mean and the big confusion around the Sabbath day, and and hopefully for those people who have listened to this broadcast, they may have a better understanding about the Sabbath day and why we keep Sunday and not the Sabbath, and why we don't have to keep the Sabbath, even although it's in the Ten Commandments, but it's mainly because the keeping of the Sabbath day is a covenant between the Jewish people, and God. Not Christians. With Christians, we keep the Lord's Day, which is Sunday. If you look at the announcements, just join us every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And you can find us on YouTube. Just type in Faithful Baptist, one word, Faithful Baptist, and you'll find our channel. Father God, we just thank you for this opportunity of coming together today. And I just pray that everybody who listens to this broadcast will be blessed and they'll get something out of it. And the end result will be that they will come closer to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're now going to play out with O Holy Night carries a Creative Commons license, O oh, Holy Night.
Amen. And I just hope that you'll be blessed with what we've been speaking about and that the Holy Ghost will bring you ever closer to Jesus Christ, to God. And that if you're not a born-again Christian at this point in time, you'll just be more and more inspired to become a born-again Christian. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen.